You should never, as he put it, never underestimate the power of incentives. Never overestimate the ability of an economist to tell which way you're going to go. You're going to run into a whole bunch of unexpected consequences. There are, in fact, several things that you have to keep track of besides incentives. One is information, and that is really central to health economics. There is an awful lot of foolish and dangerous stuff comes out of mainstream economics about healthcare systems because they make no serious attempt to take account of limitations on information flows. And that's something that I've spent much of my professional career tracking. Among others, the most distinguished economic theorist, of the, or one of the most, of the 20th century, Kenneth Arrow, <coughs> has written important and influential essays on health economics, which are just nonsense because he was working within an intellectual framework which took no sensible account of the role of information. Yeah, I mean, I think Kenneth Arrow, uh, no one can take away from his towering reputation, and yet he has probably done more harm than any other single economist to, well, actually, my former thesis advisor, Marty Feldstein, would be in the same category. <laughs> to, oh, and there's, Mar and there's Mark Pauly as well. Um, and the damage they have done intellectually through m ignoring the effects of information, institutions, and ideologies are still, and, uh, are still resonating with us in the current arguments over Obamacare. They're still out there causing trouble. It does look as if on this one, the retrograde economists may have uh, won, some, won the battles within the mainstream of the profession, but have in fact lost the war. But it's hard to be sure, because the war really never ends. Now, having been very rude about some economists, I say, I've known Marty Feldstein for a very long time. He was on my thesis committee. And to his credit, he let me get through. He probably shouldn't have, <laughs> because he sussed out at the, uh, the general exam that I really didn't understand Arrow's article, his seminal article at all, uncertainty in the welfare of the welfare, economics, and medical care. And he was right, and I didn't. And it's taken me much of my professional career to try to figure out what was wrong and what, what, uh, what Ken Arrow was up to. But he did. He, he let me through. And he, I think he was just glad to see the back of me. He said, you can go, 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 off, to, go off to Canada and cause trouble, you know, whatever. <laughs> OK. So that, the, 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 um, that, the, the I, I want to dodge back now, then, to say that in some cases, and in some times, the economists get it absolutely right. There are situations where the model works. And one of those was given by the growth controversy. In the 1970s, the uh, engineers were telling us the limits to growth, the Club of Rome, a whole lot of things coming out saying, we've estimated the current rate of drawdown of the Earth's resources category by category, and we've estimated the total amount of resources available, and we're running out. It's going to be terrible. Limits to growth, end of growth. That's it. It's over, or, not, or will be soon. The economists, most of them, looked at this and said, ah, oh, nuts. You guys just don't understand price systems. You don't understand incentives. What happens is, when there is a scarcity emerging, the prices go up, more efforts going into exploration, more efforts going into innovation to get around the problem, more, you know, all kinds of things happen in response to changes in relative prices. And they were dead right. The, engineer, the engineers were wrong. Uh, Gideon's paper does not, however, fall into this trap. Um, we wouldn't expect that. So what? Well, so you do have to take account of incentives within the context of the existing institutions and the existing ideologies. Does anybody remember peak oil? Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, we're drowning in the damn stuff. Well, no, I don't want to take that too literally. But we're told that shortly, North America will be self-sufficient in, in the fossil fuels. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, we are told that, uh, well, that uh, we, you know, we, we, can get, we can all get rich in British Columbia by exporting liquefied natural gas. And we've got to hurry up and do it really quickly, because otherwise, the rest of the market will freeze up, and we've got to we, you know, get, sell it any way we can. And if that means well, the, the risks to the environment, well, what the hell? What did the environment ever do for us? Um, <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is 
that the economists got, to, got that one dead right and the limits to growth people got it dead wrong. So we cannot underestimate the, the impact of price systems and incentives and all that stuff, but the institutions and particularly the ideology are critical. What do we do about the broader problems? Well, first of all, we've got the problems of the externalities, okay? The impacts of these sorts of developments. Sure, we've got lots, of, we've got lots more fossil fuel than we thought we had, but there are some near-term problems. Uh, some of them are sitting on the rail lines in Alberta at the moment. Some of them turned up in rather dramatic form in Quebec. We can't, we can't have that continuing, and yet, if you want to know whether it's going to continue or not, go out and track over the last year or two the stock prices for CN and, and CP. The stock market is telling you they think there's just going to be an awful lot more oil going down that, those rail lines, and while much could be done to try to make it safer by spending more money and reducing the profits, the markets don't think that's going to happen. Hmm. Well, that's a little bit of a problem. We could use the price system to deal with these issues, but the institutional and ideological structure with its, within which it is embedded makes that extremely difficult. Right? We have, in this province, a way of dealing with the, uh, well, actually, let me get one more piece first. Those are the, the, the local problems, it's local like polluting the coast of BC, but uh, yeah, they are local. The bigger problem, as I mentioned, I mentioned Lovelock before, the bigger problem is that the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, tells us, yes, the Earth is heating up, yes, we're doing it, uh, but no, it's not happening as fast as we previously thought. Well, that's good news. Uh, so, uh, so is it going to stop? Well, no, not so long as we continue in the present form, not unless we find some way of not, you, not adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Well, what could we do? Um, maybe we could um, develop fusion power. There's some really good results have come there, and maybe in another 30, 40 years, we could be developing fusion power. Well, that would help, but the problem is that even that will add heat to the globe, just not as fast. There is no long-run solution, as far as I can tell. Lester Brown may have more to say. By long-run, I mean really long-run. There's no long-run solution that doesn't involve just burning less stuff. Okay. Well, we know how to do that. Price systems work. We could, we could put on a carbon tax. Oh, no, we can't do that. That'd be outrageous. That would, be, that would have at least two major flaws. I mean, I know we've done it in this province, but it's not expanding very fast, is it? I know the Californians have done it, and God bless them, uh, but it's, not, it, it's just not on the table at all. It's an obvious fun at the federal level here. I just ridicule it, the idea of a carbon tax. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, it has two flaws. One, it actually seems to work. <laughs> the alternative, the cap-and-trade plan, doesn't. Therefore, it's clear that cap-and-trade is superior to carbon tax. But the second flaw is that cap-and-trade offers lots of opportunities for corporate profit. Carbon taxes don't. Carbon taxes will actually reduce the use of fossil fuels and reduce profitable alternatives. And so they are, in that respect, institutionally and ideologically vastly inferior to cap-and-trade or do nothing. Do nothing. It's just too important to interfere. So. That's where the, the, the institutions, the political institutions, and the, and the ideologies intervene to make it difficult to apply even those solutions which we can find. And I, I guess, I'm, again, I'm underlining the fact that the, the problem is not so much in economics itself as with some economists, and particularly in the way the economics is used. So long as we don't pretend that it's some kind of exact mathematical science, you can actually find economists saying some really remarkably se uh, sensible things, one of whom we are celebrating tonight. Um, but the overall political and ideological framework and the institutional framework with which these problems and issues are embedded make it extremely difficult actually to come to grips with uh, what we recognize as real problems. I mean, one of the most hopeful things, I said there's some very new results on fusion that look rather good. Gideon's paper drags out an earlier paper from 1955 by John von Neumann, whose name should ring a very loud bell with some of you, but uh, John von Neumann saying, yeah, we probably will eventually have fusion technology, 
which would sort of burn water instead of fossil fuels. But, you know, even that will add to the heating of the world. You will have a whole lot of little, a whole bunch of little hydrogen bombs, or maybe better, a whole lot of little suns operating all over the world, producing clean, very clean energy. But that's going to be, that's going to be, that's going to produce heat. There's no way around it. The only way I think, maybe Lester Brown will have more to say about this. I hope so. The only way I can think of that you have a really long-run solution is you've got to tap solar power. Okay. And lo and behold. Within the last month, a lady named Jillian Berniak, 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 I've got it in my notes, never mind, who has a Canada research chair at the University of Alberta, with certain, iron, certain irony in that, has discovered that uh, using nanoparticles of zinc phosphide, zinc phosphide, who knew, um, <laughs> you can produce solar cells much more cheaply than the old silicon stuff. Silicon cells are expensive to produce. They're not very efficient. Uh, you know, there's a, those are significant problems. Um, this stuff, you can apparently make it as sheets. You can sort of have a sort of a plastic sheet of this stuff, which is actually a solar cell, and it's quite a lot cheaper. It has a couple of flaws. One of them is it's not very, it's quite inefficient. But that just says more research is needed. That's that's normal in this kind of game. Uh, the second flaw is just at the present time they don't seem to know how to get the power off, the energy off, that is being produced from solar power. In other words, it's, it's working away all right, but there's no place to plug in your kettle. Um, <laughs> but there again, these are, these are problems that deserve careful attention. And I am pleased to say, since the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research has been mentioned already tonight, I'm pleased to say that the CIAR has taken an interest in, uh, uh, the, in this work. And it seems to me pretty obvious that this is the one that what you really want to do, a, a logical policy for worrying about the long run in the environment, is you start putting on the carbon taxes and put a whole lot of money into the kind of research that they're doing up at the University of Alberta. Hmm. Okay, yeah, it'll be a long time getting a payoff, going to be hard work, but it really looks at the moment like it might be quite promising. Now, do I know anything about nanotechnology? No, I don't, absolutely. I know probably... Now, maybe a little more about nanotechnology than I do about the Higgs boson, but uh, these, these are narrow comparisons. Um, but, but again, the logic just seems to me compelling that if you really want some kind of energy source that is going to, um, that's not going to heat up your planet in the long run, the only way you can do it is through solar power. So that's, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that I think is the optimistic response to the dismal science, but it's it really will depend on the institutional framework responding in such a way as to push those things forward and not to spend all our efforts trying to run more oil tankers down rail lines through populated communities to get as much... I, look, I'm preaching to the choir. I don't need to go through it. So, yeah, it, it, just, it just seems so blindingly obvious until you get to the point of saying, well, who profits by the present framework? Now, economists are... Really, really, you know, they, they're, they're, like, like every other issue, they're on both sides of this one. Um, you think about somebody like Ken Boulding, who wrote Spaceship Earth back in the 70s. Again, one of the things, sources referenced by Gideon. It's Gideon's paper. Yeah, it was, it was wrong or it was misleading to think about the Earth having this very limited supply of raw materials in its hold and that we were going to run out of them very soon. That turns out not to be a, a sensible way of looking at things in general. But if we think about it instead in terms of the environment on the spaceship in which we have to live, the atmosphere, the water, then that's actually quite an enlightening way of looking. So you could pick up Bolding, who was a rather unusual economist. You could pick up a basic idea that we could carry forward now, even as we leave behind the kind of engineering view of the limits to growth. But 